Now it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage uh, Pietro Barroil and Martin Schwartzel. Thank you for this nice introduction. So hi and welcome to this talk about custom processing unit tracing and patching into Atom microcode. I'm Martin and I'm Pietro. So today you will, we will present you the first static and dynamic analysis framework for CPU microcode, all done via software. Yeah. So we give the people a, a short outline now. So we first start off with a deep dive on CPU microcode, especially the, the Atom microcode. Then we'll present you a, the first static and analysis software framework for microcode. Then based on that, we show you how you can use the framework to reverse engineer the microcode update algorithm. And, and then we will end up with some bonus content. So, First of all, a disclaimer. This is based on like, our understanding of CPU microcode. So in theory, it could be all wrong. But in practice, we will see that a lot seems right. Mm -hmm. So but before we get into the deep dive, we will go to like, a high level view on how CPUs work. So at the university, most people learn you have like, this fetch, decode, execute, write back steps. And yeah, basically, we can see it in this high level view. There is this front end doing that fetch and decode stage, and then there is the out of order engine, and somewhere there is the memory subsystem in between where it like, tries to speed up things using caches and all this stuff. Yes, but it's, it's not that simple, obviously. And x86 instructions, like to be executed effectively, they get translated into micro operations. And OK, most of them are like really simple instructions. So like they have one or two micro operations, like think about if you access memory or like you are to, like, to, to register, for example. But like some instructions need some more complex logic. Like think about CPU ID, where you have like multiple leaves and you have like conditional execution based on the input that you do. So there is a component called the microcode sequencer that can, takes care of like emitting a stream of micro operations that implement the logic of complex instructions. Yeah, but before we go deeper into that, we'll have to talk about the preliminary thing, and that's the red unlock finding from positive technologies from Mark Ermolov and his team. So they basically found an, an exploit in the SS, SMM engine, and they basically managed to red unlock the CPU into a special state such that they can debug it and read out special um, buffers like caches or staging buffers, similar things. And based on that, they managed to extract and reverse engineer the gold mode U-code format. They presented a uh, disassembler for that, and based on the reverse engineering, they discovered new undocumented instructions, which basically allow it to control the access to internal buffers. Yes, but like to, to understand what can we do based on this work, we have to understand first like how does the like microcode stuff work, and we are talking about this microcode sequencer. You like let's assume that you have an instruction like CPU ID that needs a stream of micro operations. You have like a translation table where like the instruction gets matched, and you will jump to the microcode ROM where the CPU will take micro instructions and execute them to like implement the complex logic. The, the micro instructions are like organized in triads, and every single triad has a sequence word associated to it. Like a sequence word effect, uh, maybe affects some synchronization during the micro operations. Like think about like elf fence like stuff, or even the control flow while executing this. So obviously. If it was like that, you have a ROM, and the CPU code will be fixed. So what if you have like, to patch some bug, like Epic Click, for example, mm -hmm. and you have like, to fix that? So CPU like, also support a ROM um, uh, like kind of internal memory where you can like, edit and patch the microcode there. But how can you pass between these two internal buffers? There is a component called the match and patch that every time you execute an instruction, if that instruction is like, programmed to jump, to the RAM, the match and patch will redirect the control flow to the RAM and execute the new instruction that are patched there. Mm -hmm. So um, now I, I, I managed to look into the disassembly and I found these triads here we're managing. So we have these three operations. The fourth one was always a NOP operation. And then we have the sequence words you mentioned, which are basically properties about the current microcode instructions. But if you look at that, it's like uh, <laughs> you cannot really read that. So we use the disassembler, obviously. And then we see like 
the microcode has a similar structure to x86. Yeah, it's really similar. Mm -hmm. So you have branching instructions, you have internal temporary registers, and the things in blue, if you see them, they're these sequence word instructions. So they're, for instance, the last line shows the next um, instru uh, microcode instruction being executed. Yes, and every sequence word is associated to all the three micro instructions that you mm -hmm. have there. But if we look at the microcode, we can see that it's highly optimized. So in the CPU, we have a, like, a small buffer. We have to like, pack all the instructions that you want to, like, to use to implement the functionalities that you want to microcode there. So the microcode is highly tangled. You have like, blocks of code that are shared between multiple functions. So it's really hard to like, analyze it. And I mean, it would be cool to have like, a high level view of the microcode. But unfortunately, it, like, at the compiler, for example, for this doesn't exist since it's like, it was undocumented. Mm -hmm. So we wrote one. So you see here, this is a Ghidra decompiler. It actually looks cool. And you can, um, for instance, see the RC4 decrypt function, which is later on, as we will show, used in the update algorithm. And you see clearly that's like beautiful C code. And you can work on that and start your reverse engineering with that. So when I was going through this whole thing, I saw like there was a special interaction always with, with a, a certain component. And this one was called the CR bus. So yes. So to, to understand better like what can you do with this, we have to understand what is the control register bus. And it's like the bus that the CPU uses to interact with its internal components. So for example, like MSRs are mapped into CR bus addresses, some of them actually, and also, or also like control status registers are effectively like addresses in this year bus where the CPU access them to implement the functionality that you want. Like system management mode configuration is mapped to the CR bus. System management mode is like this ring minus two mode in the CPU that is like really like locked down that you should never access that. And the like configuration for that is in the CR bus. And also like interesting, like also the LDAT is mapped into the CR bus. So what, what is that LDAT? So I guess yeah. people So know. the LDAT is this like really interesting component in uh, like Intel CPUs that is used for like post silicon validation. And this is a component that has access to like all the internal buffers of the CPU. Like let's think about, for example, the TLB or like load and store buffers. So through the LDAT, you can check that this component actually work. That's awesome. So yes. And, and also, for example, you have access to the microcode sequencer oh. through, this year, mm -hmm. through the LDAT. So the microcode sequencer, you already mentioned that. So what does it exactly do? So yeah, like as we say, the microcode sequencer is the component that has access to the microcode in the CPU, both to the ROM and to the RAM. And interestingly, it, access, it has bright access to the RAM. So leveraging the microcode sequencer, you have access to the microcode and to like modify it. So here we can, I would say, let's have an idea. We know that the LDAT can access the microcode sequencer, and that the LDAT is, can be accessed through the CR bus. All right. So if we now access the CR bus, we can basically control the microcode. Yes, basically, if you can access the CR bus, then you have microcode control. OK. But we so, need one more building block. Oh, yeah. So you were talking about, or I was talking actually about these undocumented instructions. So let's take a look at how those work. and what we can access with them. Yeah, so like one of the discoveries of positive technology guys was this existence of this undocumented instruction that has access with like a few internal components of the CPU. Among those, that's the shear bus. Awesome, so we have our primitive too. So yeah, we can leverage this primitive as an easy way to access the shear bus for red unlocked CPUs like the Goldmont. But the problem is that, okay, but what can we do with this? How can we access the LDAT? Like, how does it work? And here, like, our decompiler comes handy, since we can analyze what the CPU does with the CR bus to access the LDAT, to modify the microcode sequencer, and just copy that. Yes. We know that the CPU knows how to do that, so we can just do the same thing. And we can define, like, easy wrappers around this, where you can, like, access the microcode sequencer. And, for example, with these wrappers that, like, just copy what the CPU are doing and access the uh, like LDAT ports. You can like access the microcode, access the sequence word, and even the match and patch. Yeah. So we have arbitrary read and write, and you already mentioned that match and patch mechanism. So we were thinking about it like maybe to a similar extent as like software hooking, 
where you say, like, ah, I want to overwrite this function and re point, redirect it to the other one. So is it, is it really that simple in, in the microcode? Yeah, so we can still leverage our the compiler to understand how the CPU uses the match and patch. And device, like the simple formula that the CPU uses to like, program this match and patch. So every time we want to hook something or patch something, we can program the address to the match and patch to just jump to the instruction that we want. Awesome. So if we sum that up, this is like I can hook a microcode update and override it with my own code. So it's super custom now. Yes, and this brings to our framework. We can leverage this undocumented instruction to patch the microcode via software. This allows us to observe completely the CPU behavior, but also to completely control their behavior. And all of this via software, like either with a custom BIOS, like a UEFI application, or a kernel module. So summing up the framework, I think we can now patch code, we can hook code, run our own custom code, and I think we can even do more, right? We can yes, trace, we can the, trace the code, and we will see how. But let's start first from patching code. So with U-code patches, we can change the CPU behavior. And notice that usually only Intel is allowed to do that, since microcode patches are signed, and you're not supposed to load your patches. But with our framework, we can inject microcode patches to change completely the CPU behavior. Like, we can change microcoded instructions with this, or even add functionalities to the CPU. So maybe we go a, a, a step back. I think it's too complicated here at the moment. Let's do a simple program, maybe something like Hello World in microcode. Yes, so let me present you the first microcode patch Hello World. <laughs> so I was thinking, what can we do with an Hello World? And like, let's pick the RDRUND instruction, for example. So RDRUND is supposed to provide you a cryptographically strong random number. So let's piece up some cryptographers, and let's make it return hello world. With our framework, you can select what do we want to, to hook, and then where do you want to jump for the instruction. And you can see there we have two micro operations that load hello world to the registers, so that you will not have random numbers, but hello world there. And then you just end the instruction stream and tell the CPU, OK, you're done. Mm -hmm. but I think you left out one point. We kind of need to assemble this stuff. Yes, so we brought an assembler for the microcode so that our framework translates from a textual representation of the microcode to the interactions that you need to do to the microcode sequencer to actually patch the microcode. So we assemble the microcode, write it to the address that we set, in this case, 7C00, that is just the like, starting address of the UCode RAM. And then we set up the match and patch so that every time you execute RDRUND, you actually return L word. Mm. So I think the example is kind of nice and handy, but I think the people here want to see something more yeah, advanced. It is kind of lame, right? Yeah, it, it is, yeah. So let's do something more interesting. We can, OK, we know that RD run returns like random data. So like, let's change this. I don't like random data. I want to look something interesting. So let's make RD run return system management mode memory. So system management mode is this caged environment in the CPU. It's like this ring minus two mode where you are not obviously supposed to access it. But we can change the microcode for the RDRUND instruction to just load the SMROM address, for example. But what happens if you now read from this address? So yeah, this is like a caged memory. So if you do this, you will read a bunch of Fs. Like if you access, for example, enclave memory from outside an enclave, the CPU protects, sorry, the MMU protects that region, so you will not be able to access it. But we are in the microcode, so we can change this. And leveraging our framework, we can understand where the configuration for the SMROM is like, located in the CR bus, and actually zero it out, That's so nice. that this SMROM will not be protected anymore. Yes, but then you break the CPU, right? Yeah, so the CPU will not be happy about this since you're like, like, just disabling SMM. So you can save and restore the SMM configuration, but just after you're dumping that. Oh, that's really nice. So, but I think the people might not believe us, so let's show them a, a demo. Yeah, like, let's show something cool. Mm -hmm. So here, for example, we have a simple program in a UEFI application where you just dump like, the RDRUN address, like the RDRUN uh, result with random data here. But we can program the CPU with our patches to change it and actually return L word to that. So that with, this, with our CPU framework, with our custom processing unit framework, we hook the patch, and the next time that you execute RDRUN, you have L word. Wow. 
That's super cool. And about the system management? Yes. So let's go there. More mm -hmm. cool stuff. Yeah. And we still have a, like a simple program that dumps a bunch of buffer filled with RDRun content. And it's obviously random since RDRun returns random data. But let's apply our patch. The patch that you've seen before, just modify to like dump different addresses and not only one. And we can apply our patch. And the next time you execute the program that dumps memory the RDRun, you actually dump system management mode memory. And you can see the header of system management mode there. Oh, yeah. Awesome. So going further, so now we can do something more. You already mentioned it. What happens if we now set up this match and patch mechanism and execute custom microcode at a certain events, right? Yeah. And resume the execution. We basically don't need to patch stuff but we actually find something out about it. Yeah, so we, we don't have to like, stop an instruction after the rooking that you can simply continue the execution. And this brings to like, microcode hooks, where you can execute more code and extend the functionalities of something, or for example, observe stuff. So after executing an instruction, if you resume the execution, the CPU will like, not even notice that you like, hijacked that. And for example, here, we can, like, make our own performance counters. So let's assume that you want to observe something in a CPU, but like, the CPU is not nice enough to already have that performance counter that you want to observe set up for you. And let's assume that you want to observe, I don't know, every time the ver w extraction is executed. You know, Intel uses a lot this instruction to like, uh, patch like, vulnerabilities there to flush internal buffers, for example, for MDS mitigation. So maybe you want to understand, OK, but okay, given a full system, let me know how many times you, you did that, actually. Exactly. And we can leverage our hooks to hook the entry point of the instruction that we want to trace, so, sorry, that we want to hook, and then continue it after. And in our hook, we can just implement a simple counter that will be incremented every time the instruction is executed. So you will effectively have defined your own performance counter. That's awesome. But I guess we can even do more with that. Yes, we can be smarter with the hooks. If we define a hook that every time it gets triggered, like it just dumps the timestamp when it got triggered, you can then uh, like program this hook for every single micro-operation in the CPU. And every time an, um, a micro-operation will be executed, you will dump the timestamp where that micro-operation is executed. In the end, you will have all the timestamp that got triggered by this hook, and then you can reorder them. So that effectively, you can obtain a trace of the micro-operations that are executed in the CPU. And this basically leads to a microcode control flow, right? You yes. exactly know what's going on inside. You, you are effectively doing a dynamic trace of the microcode that is executed in the CPU. So now we have all the building blocks to look at the microcode update routine. Yeah, so Let's what can we do with these traces? Okay. For example, we can apply these traces. So you can observe like, literally everything that the CPU is doing with the microcode. And we did that for microcode updates. So if you look at the microcode updates statically, you will find a huge amount of code that will be like, really hard to reverse engineering, even with our decompiler. But with traces, it gets much better, since you can observe exactly which control flow inside the microcode updates is taken. Mm -hmm. So now we can trigger microcode update, for instance then trace if a macro instruction is executed, and then repeat it for all the possible microcode instructions, and then we just re restore the order again, check out yes. the timestamps, and we see exactly which microcode instructions were yes. accessed. Hard. So you effectively reverse engineer the microcode update algorithm mm -hmm. that is always being kept secret by Intel. Mm -hmm. So here we like, analyze what is happening during a microcode update, and a microcode update is usually triggered by a bright MSR. And the first thing that the CPU does is, OK, you have to apply this update and decrypt it. So it first moves the update to a secret location that is not more secret, but it's like FPV01000, for example, in Goldman CPUs. And this is a special physical address where the CPU puts the microcode update. And we can look at the format of the microcode update that we reverse engineered. At the beginning, you have like some metadata that is like the date where the microcode update was published, the security version number of the CPU ID that the, the microcode update is for. And then you have like a nonce. We will like focus on that later. But it's used to like generate the decryption key for the microcode update. And then you have the RSA signature stuff, so that you can like the CPU can verify that the microcode update was actually from Intel and it was signed. So the first thing that happens at the microcode update is okay. You have to check that the 
seeing at all is what you expect for. So the CPU has a white list of the modulus and the exponent that it can accept so that he knows that it not, didn't got tampered. Then you, then you have to generate the key to decrypt the update. And the CPU does this with two different secrets. One secret is the nonce, and it's embedded in every single microcode update, and it's always different per update. Then you have another secret that is per CPU, and every CPU has this like, in, like uh, secret random number that it uses in combination with the nonce to generate and to like, do a key expansion algorithm based on a SHA to generate the decryption key. The RC4 key then is generated so that we can like, uh, use RC4 to decrypt. And as a best practice, and they do that, they eliminate the first OX200 bytes since they were like, too tight with the like, key bytes. So now I guess that after generating the key, we can go to decrypt the yes. update. Obviously, after having to decrypt the update, you have to check that the decrypted update, the decrypted update was actually signed correctly. So the SHA-256 of the update is calculated, with, is computed, combining with the metadata and the NANS so that you cannot tamper with that. And if the verification succeeds, then you finally can parse the microcode update. Awesome. So I was wondering, you were, are mentioning this weird address here at the beginning. So w what is that? Yeah, so it's so interesting to try to deepen, OK, what is this address? This address is like this special physical location that the CPU uses to save the microcode update there, mm -hmm. to, to move the microcode update there. So if we query the operating system, the poor operating system will have no idea what is this address is for. Mm -hmm. And we can also try to dump this address, and we will only read Fs, like if you access an enclave or SSM memory without mm -hmm. unprotecting it. So it must be something special. Yes. So we should further investigate that maybe like using our framework to see what's going on, right? Yes, so we can see what this, the CPU is doing with this address. And we can see that this address is dynamically enabled by the CPU. Every time the microcode update is performed, the CPU writes to the CR bus like a bit that enables this address. And we can poke around this address. Mm -hmm. So we can like, measure the access time when this address is enabled. And this is surprising, it's only 20 cycles. Mm -hmm. So MMIO usually is really slow, and this address is surprisingly fast. But we can also observe that the content of this address is not shared between the CPUs. It's like the CPU has a local view on this address. And we can only fit a small amount, a relatively small amount of data, even if the mapped area is much bigger. And then we observe a replacement policy on the address while we write them, we lose the data sometimes. OK, that, that, that reminds me of something. You have 20 cycles, which is super fast. Then it's not shared between cores. It fits to a certain size, and then you have replacement policy. So this kind of indicates that it's kind of a cache, right? Yeah, so our hypothesis is that the CPU, through this physical address, has a special view on the L2 cache that is like frozen and used for the microcode update so that, they have, so that the CPU has like a private buffer that is not accessible or tamperable from, for example, other cores. Mm -hmm. So let's look at the decrypted microcode update. Yeah, so finally we got the microcode decrypted. And you can look at the structure. Oh, yeah. So you see some kind of structure here again, but yeah, it looks like a bytecode, maybe? So what, yeah. what so is it? Yeah, so we can still use our decompiler to try to understand, OK, what is the CPU doing with this update? And it turns out that a microcode update is actually bytecode that is interpreted by the CPU. It's like if you download an installer that tells you how to update the CPU. And you have different commands that the CPU, does, like the CPU follows while updating. For example, resetting internal buffers, writing the microcode for the update, setting the match and patch hooks, or even control flow directives. So during the update, you can have like conditional parts of the update based on different conditions. Mm -hmm. So this basically allows you to deprecate things, enable things, disable Yeah, like things. dynamically. Yeah. Wow. That's nice. So we should put all this together to build a decryptor. Yeah, so we created a parser for microcode update, collected all the microcode update that we could decrypt, knowing the CPU secrets, so Goldman CPUs, and we decrypted all of them. And we released them publicly so that you can look at that. All right, that's super nice. Uh, one thing to mention also the decompiler is like referred to in the, in the repository. We don't it's a separate GitHub. Yeah, but and the decompiler supports microcode updates so that you can 
observe an high level view of what the macro code updates actually patches. Mm -hmm. But you already also mentioned at the beginning that there's some more, some bonus content. Yeah, so. okay, let's look at something cooler. Yeah. And okay, all this talk was about Goldman CPUs, but does this generalize? So it's really hard to say how much this generalizes, but we can here, for example, use a cool technique uh, by Brandon Fork to trace the performance counters during the MacroCode update. So the whole world stops during the MacroCode update, but not the performance counters. So if we trace the load, sorry, the execution ports usage during the update, we can try to infer what is happening during the update. And we can see, okay, like sometimes load and store ports are used a lot. So like this is like memory bound stuff, maybe like mem copying around, maybe arithmetic stuff is used more. So you have a phase where the micro code is decrypted. So you can kind of try to guess what is happening there. And maybe a machine learning guy would be handy here to understand what it's doing. <laughs> yes, maybe. Is there some machine learning guy here? <laughs> Good. But then let's go to data. some more bonus. Oh, contents. yes. Yeah. You, you were mentioning like yesterday the, the Epic League, and I think you, we can kind of use the Epic. Yeah, so we saw this special experiment. address, and the CPU wants to access that address. Yesterday we were talking about Epic MMIO, and we can take inspiration from a really cool exploit by Chris Domas, where this called Memory Sinkhole, where you can move the Epic to shadow different things. So originally the exploit was, doing, was like leveraged to like break system management mode, but here we can move the Epic MMIO region over the L2 cache view of the processor, mm -hmm. so that the processor actually access the Epic and not the micro update content. So this is actually a failed exploit, unfortunately, but yes. we tried both to move the Epic MMIO over, for example, the SHA tables that the micro update is like using to compute the SHA so that we can, like, for example, generate a wrong SHA that is not cryptographically secure to like, bypass the signatures. And even we tried to like, place the Epic MMIO over the microcode buffer when it's decrypted to leak that. But the complexities of the microcode update algorithm prevented us to exploit it further. But I think that's a cool like, future direction to look into. Yes, definitely. So um, concluding our talk, so you saw or learned a bit about microcode today and we deepen our understanding. But using the framework, you can even like, go further and learn more about the microcode using our decompiler, assembler, patcher, and tracer. And so our framework is open source. You can start hacking around your CPU. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.